just released his ruling in the disqualification hearing as defendants in the election interference case sought to have Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis and Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade removed from this case. All right, we have the ruling in our hand right now. The judge ruled that DA Willis can stay on the case, but with some very big conditions. The tone of this decision is harsh, pretty scolding, calling the relationship with Wade a tremendous lapse in judgment and left at least the appearance that the couple financially benefited from that move. We want to take you live outside the Fulton County Courthouse. This part of this case has become a national story all unfolding right now. Of course, this courtroom, the backdrop for the disqualification hearing. Yeah, we're bringing in our investigator, Zach Merchant, who just, you just got your hands on this ruling, on a copy of it. You've been going through it. We did. Um, what were some of the biggest takeaways that you that you noticed? And you're right, we just got uh, a copy of this. This is it. It's a more than 20-page order. We're going to read through this a little bit together. We want to start with the biggest takeaway. It happens on page 17 of Judge Scott McAfee's order, and I'm, if it's all right, I'm going to read it, and we can kind of work through it all sure. together. This is the big part here. Judge McAfee writes, the court therefore concludes that the prosecution of this case cannot proceed until the state selects one of two options. The district attorney may choose to step aside along with the whole of her office and refer the prosecution to the prosecuting attorney's counsel for reassignment. Alternatively, this is option two, special assistant district attorney Wade can withdraw, allowing the district attorney, the defendants, and the public to move forward without his presence distracting from and potentially compromising, the judge says, the merits of this case. So the district attorney's office now has two options in front of them and a, a pretty weighty choice before sure. District Attorney Funny Willis. Yeah, one mm -hmm. or the other must go, but very significant that it allows the option for this case to stay in Fulton County, which is key for a, a lot of reasons. One, a jury pool would remain the same. Also, this is the office that has spent so long investigating this case, knows the ins and outs of it, also so well versed in racketeering cases, specifically, which not every jurisdiction is so um, well versed at. So it's that's big. Very big. It's a, a particularly complex statute. Georgia's RICO statute in particular, even compared to the national statute, is exceedingly complex. This is also a, a case with that started with 19 defendants. So the idea of this case being removed to a different district attorney's office raises a whole host of challenges, not the least of which is imagine you're some other district attorney in DeKalb or Cobb or Gwinnett or wherever else and you are tasked with taking on this endeavor, just getting up to speed and mm -hmm. understanding the nuances of it would be a, a Herculean task. And that's we can't get inside the head of District Attorney Fonnie Willis, but you've got to imagine that's going to weigh on her decision-making process because mm -hmm. those two options, Special Assistant District Attorney, the Special Prosecutor, Nathan Wade, can withdraw from the case, and the DA, DA Fonnie Willis, and the rest of her office, according to Judge Scott McAfee, can move forward. Or the other option is that DA Willis mm -hmm. steps aside. When she goes, her whole office is then removed from the case. And what happens here, and we can take a minute to break down a little bit of the sure. order's language, what would happen in that scenario is the case would be sent up to what's called the Prosecuting Attorney's mm -hmm. Council. It's sort of a, an oversight and organizational body for every district attorney in the state. And then that organization would be responsible for finding a new home for this case. And it's important to underscore this point, once that happened, and it could take time to find another DA's office that is willing to take on this case and has the resources, they have total autonomy over it. Mm -hmm. So there's no guarantee in that scenario where the case goes somewhere else that uh, the prosecution would remain intact as it at least originally began. Yeah, and let's talk about the timeline because, you know, the the Fulton County District Attorney's Office, they wanted to try this case at least by August. And if the district attorney were to step down, this would delay the start of that trial even further. You're right, and you get to a, a really important point I think it is worth us taking a second to, to dig into here because there's sort of a couple different tracks when you're in complex litigation like this. There's the, the factual arguments and making sure you build a robust defense on the fact for your clients. That's the job of a defense attorney. But there's also what you might call sort of procedural strategy. And delay in this case seems to have been a deliberate choice. And uh, you see it in many cases where you try to raise as many procedural issues as possible to move that timeline out, give yourself more opportunity to get new information to defend your client. And in this case, that is really without precedent. 
uh, mm -hmm. in our city, in our state, and up until last year when we saw several other criminal cases against former President Trump pop up around the nation, unprecedented around the country, there is the election in November hanging over all of this. And mm -hmm. you've got to imagine some members of the f defense team want to drag this out as long mm -hmm. as possible, maybe to try to avoid trial before the November election, which many legal experts now say is not impossible, but increasingly going to be a difficult date to get this trial set by. Mm -hmm. This is charged on so many levels. It's politically charged. The timeline is charged. People are watching this uh, with a lot of different filters. Yeah, and also Judge Scott McAfee, he's up for re-election, mm -hmm. as well as the DA. She's also up for re-election. Now, you mentioned you can't get in the head of DA Fonnie Willis. You, we don't know which way she will go. If the special prosecutor were to step aside from this case, it will not de delay the expected timeline. It wouldn't move things back, I think, any farther than they already have been. It, it, this has been a more than two month now saga. It started as a, a, a single motion filed by one of the defense attorneys, Ashley Merchant. She represents Michael Roman, one of the 19 inde indicted co-defendants in this case. It happened on January 8th and it, it became the issue for yeah. two months here and those two months now are, are gone. Mm -hmm. We are following breaking news here on 11 Alive, bringing in our viewers here on NBC. Breaking news, Judge McAfee has released his ruling in the disqualification hearing as defendants in the election interference case sought to have Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis and Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade removed from the case. Cheryl Preheim here with Ariana Manise. Uh, the judge ruled the DA Willis can stay on this case but with some very big conditions. The tone of the decision, pretty scolding, calling her relationship with Wade a tremendous lapse in judgment and left the appearance that the couple financially benefited from that move. We want to bring in Zach Merchant. Zach, you're looking at this through the eyes of a journalist, also one with a law degree. What stands out to you, perhaps the biggest thing, is that it does leave the opening for this case to stay in Fulton County. This is sort of a, a split the baby decision in a lot of ways from Fulton County Superior Court Judge Scott McAfee. A lot of legal experts thought he would have to make one of two decisions in this disqualification question. He would have to either rule that no disqualification is warranted or that disqualification is warranted full stop and the DA's office, Fonnie Willis, all of her prosecutors that work for her, including Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade, would have to be removed from the case. That's not what happened here. We're reading the order right now, and I, I want to read you two sentences from this order. We're working through it together, but this is the big takeaway, and I want to use Judge Scott McAfee's language here because it's best to hear it from the source. So here we go. This is Judge Scott McAfee writing in the order this morning. He writes, the court therefore concludes that the prosecution of this case cannot proceed until the state selects one of two options. The district attorney may choose to step aside along with the whole of her office and refer the prosecution to the prosecuting attorney's counsel for reassignment. Alternatively, this is the second option, special assistant district attorney Nathan Wade can withdraw, allowing the district attorney, the defendants, and the public to move forward without his presence or remuneration distracting from and potentially compromising the merits of this case. That's strong language. Mm -hmm. That is, a, in legal terms, a pretty harsh rebuke of Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade, and it sets up a weighty, weighty choice for Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Wells. She's got to choose, and I guess Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade also has to choose. Does Nathan Wade stay on this case, or does he go, allowing the rest of the DA's office, including Fonnie Willis, to remain? Yeah, but if the DA were to step aside, as we mentioned, this will delay the trial even further because a new prosecutor's office will have to take on this case, mm -hmm. go through the files, go through the evidence, go through everything that this office has already worked through. Yeah, absolutely right. And this is not, uh, I'm saying something that I think you all know if you're watching this, this is not a normal case. It is a particularly complex one with exceedingly high stakes and incredibly uh, well-known, prominent defendants uh, that are well defended as well. So any new district attorney's office, if it gets to that point, and we don't know, it's all going to hinge on D.A. Willis's decision on what to do of these two options. But if she chooses to keep Nathan Wade on the case, well, that means really no one stays on the case. Her whole office is disqualified. And what happens procedurally in Georgia is that 
the oversight body for prosecutors statewide, known as the Prosecuting Attorneys Council of Georgia, will in effect take custody of the case, and it will then be their responsibility to find a new home, a new district attorney to pursue the case. That process of finding that new home could take months. The new DA, once they are uh, onto the case, will surely take months just to get up to speed on the more than 18, 19 total mm -hmm. defendants that were in this case. They've got to reread all the evidence. And then importantly, they have full autonomy over what happens in that case. So if we get to a point where this case finds a new home, a new DA is overseeing it, they may decide to pursue it in some other form that this is all hypothetical here, or telescoped way out, mm -hmm. but they could decide maybe some of these defendants they don't want to pursue after all. Mm -hmm. So uh, this decision DA Fonnie Willis has to make has some major ramifications. Yeah, and we do know that four defendants, they did take pleas. Mm -hmm. If a different prosecutor's office were to take on this case, will those plea agreements still stay in place? Yes, yeah, okay. plea agreement, those are finalized, those are done. All right, let's dive a little deeper into this decision that's just come down uh, from Judge McAfee. The judge says that conflict was not proven, that did not the evidence good, did not go as far as the lawyers for essentially the Trump team suggested. However, the lawyer said there was a, an appearance of conflict and that was the bar that must be met. And that might give us some insight into why it is sort of a split decision here, saying that Either D.A. Fonnie Willis and her team must go or Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade must go. The judge saying that the D.A. here made a choice to supervise and continue to pay Special Prosecutor Wade despite the fact that they were in a relationship. And that's what caused the muddying of the waters here. Yeah. It seems that Judge McAfee did, to, to some degree, find some merit in the defense team's argument that the contractual arrangement with Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade and the fact that DA Fonnie Willis had a romantic relationship with him did put a certain amount of taint or at least the appearance of, of something improper on this case. In one line, Judge McAfee writes, and he spells it right out here, he says that the court finds, based largely on the DA's own testimony, that the evidence showed that the financial gain flowing from her relationship with Nathan Wade was not a motivating factor on the part of the district attorney to indict and prosecute this case. So that's sort of landing a, a point in her camp. That's saying we don't think this was an actually motivating factor to bring this case. But later on, he says it still gave that appearance. It mm -hmm. looked not quite right. And that's how he gets to this decision. Yeah, and e even though this may seem like a partial victory for D.A. Fonnie Willis, he states that he does not condone this lapse in judgment mm -hmm. in, in his ruling. So even though, you know, he is allowing her to stay on this case, giving her the option, he's not letting her off the hook, especially when you look at the language sure. that he uses in this ruling. It's like a reprimand. Yes. It, it very much is. And, and you know, Judge Scott McAfee is a new judge. He's uh, only been on the bench for about a year in Fulton County. He's young, and I say all that because when judges have been around for a while, you get to know their style a bit more. Some are more bombastic from the bench. Some are more reserved. We've seen Scott McAfee very reserved in the hearings we've, we've watched in this case, but for him to use this kind of language is um, telling, and perhaps even more so, that his demeanor is the way it is. This is him saying something did not look right here, and it needs to be resolved mm -hmm. before we move forward, especially especially, you know, it's in a case of this level of public interest where the even just the sense of justice needs to be totally above board in his view. Yeah. We're looking at a live picture of the Fulton County Courthouse. That's an epicenter of perhaps one of the biggest court cases and political cases the country has ever seen. The headliner of the defendants, of course, being former President Trump, who is now the Republican nominee for president for 2024. And the reason it's so significant, I think we can't stress this enough, that the judge gave an opening for this case to remain in the courthouse you're looking at right now is a couple of things. One, the Fulton County jury pool is very key here, mm -hmm. and that would stay the same. And secondly, this is a district attorney's office that is very well versed in racketeering cases. Currently one going on in the YSL trial right now. Of course, a RICO case is trying to prove that an extensive web of people worked together with a criminal intent, and that is the crux of this election interference case. Yeah. It, it very much is, and uh, looking at this image we're seeing right now, so much history has happened just in the last nine months in that building um, with this case, and, and it's going to be 
it would just be such a challenge for another district attorney's office to take this this on. Yeah, my question now is, um, will it be hard to select a jury pool? We saw the YSL trial, how long it took to see the jury pool. And the fact that this hearing alone got so much media attention, mm -hmm. you know, the world pretty much saw the testimonies play out over the course of two days or so. Will we be able to see this jury process happen swiftly with the fact that this got so much attention? Sure. Uh, and, and being in Atlanta, you're watching us, you know, many of you are from Atlanta, you have a sort of unique legal vantage point. We've seen a big RICO case happen before, this YSL case, and we've seen that it takes months, or at least it can, and in that case, it did take months to seat a jury. This case, I've spoken to legal experts, one with decades of experience, uh, both as a defense attorney and as a prosecutor. He said, I don't want to go as far as saying it will be impossible to seat a jury. Nothing's impossible. Mm -hmm. But it was already going to be difficult. And these last two months of controversy and incredibly high interest in them will make it even more difficult to yeah. get a, a suitable jury sat. And the question now is, will the attention shift over to the actual charges? that we're seeing play out in this case instead of this relationship that became the epicenter of this trial. Like DA Fonnie Willis said, mm -hmm. I'm not on trial. These people right. are. So now that this is somewhat behind us in this, this hearing, well, we see the attention shift over to the charges. Like just this week, we saw the judge rule to dismiss six charges related to this case. Mm -hmm. That's right. And I think you're right. I think certainly the state very much wants to wants to have that happen for, from the start. They want to keep the focus on the facts as they allege them. And as you mentioned, as D.A. Willis said, she's not on trial. These defendants are on trial. Mm -hmm. We do need to point out, though, this may not be the last we hear about this decision. Certainly, we've talked at length now that D.A. Willis has an important decision to make on whether to uh, keep Nathan Wade on the case or not. But there's another mm -hmm. element here hanging out in, the, in the, the wings that is worth pointing out, and that's the issue of appeal. Sure. Mm -hmm. If you're watching this, you're probably thinking, well, wait a second, uh, there's, there's a judgment that in some ways you could see was you know, adverse to mm -hmm. the district attorney, was not uh, the one that she was looking for. Can't you appeal that? The answer is a little complicated. We've talked to a lot of legal experts, and in Georgia, the state has some limitations on what they can appeal and what they can't appeal. And uh, one individual we talked with with decades of experience as a district attorney, he's now out of that office, but he said it might be difficult for the district attorney's office to appeal this order from Judge McAfee for some procedural reasons. That we don't want to get too far in the legal weeds, but. In Georgia, you've got to have what's known as a sort of final judgment, something with finality, mm -hmm. in order to be able to appeal it. Even though this order threatens to remove the district attorney's office, and even if that removal actually happened, depending on what D.A. Willis chooses, the argument could be, and this legal expert suggested it would be, that it's not final. The state can still prosecute this case. You're just substituting the players. Um, and that could be another legal wrinkle we've got to work through. As mm -hmm. you're talking about appeals, I'm thinking about kind of the other side of the equation here. Ashley Merchant, who represents Trump co-defendant Michael Roman, uh, brought this forward. January 8th was the day the world learned about all of this. And what a wild ride it's been since, mm -hmm. right? Is there any recourse? Because the goal on that side was to get the case essentially thrown out, right? Is there any recourse from attorney Ashley Merchant moving forward? Can they, in other words, can they appeal as Say, well? Wait, we don't like the way this turned mm -hmm. out. There's, there's, you know, there's too much, you know, That's saying that point. it can stay as is. You know, it's, it, it, the legal language here is, is uh, a little dense, but the last line is, the defendant's motions are therefore granted in part and denied in part. Mm -hmm. Everybody gets a little bit. Nobody gets fully what they want. It's sort of like if you've got kids and you know you want to have split the cookie and you yeah. say, you split it, uh -huh. but I pick. Everybody gets a little bit, but nothing uh, all the way up. The defense team, if they want to appeal this, and that would be a strategic choice they have to make as well, they could say this is an outcome that they are pretty happy with. Mm -hmm. We can't get in their head, but yeah. they, they have, in order to appeal, they'd have to get what's called a certificate of immediate review if they want to appeal this right away. Okay. You can wait until this goes all the way to trial and then you can raise the appeal then. But you've got to imagine the judge wouldn't want to do that. Uh, you don't want to do two trials, and that could be the case if the appeal gets overturned. So if they want to appeal right now, they've got to ask the judge basically for permission, get this certificate of immediate review, and then appeal this decision immediately up to the Georgia Court of Appeals and let them weigh in on it, yeah. get an answer, and then come back and move towards trial again. We don't know if they're going to take that route, and we don't know 
if the judge would grant that certificate either. Mm -hmm. And then speaking to the appeals process, you know, the judge states in his ruling whether this case ends in convictions, acquittals, or something in between, the result should be one that instills confidence in the process. He wants to make sure that people still believe in Georgia's legal system with this ruling, especially mm -hmm. the language that he used. He did not let D.A. Fonnie Willis off the hook. He's saying, you know, you need to choose either between you staying on this case or getting rid of Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade. I think that's a really important point to underscore. And, and again, Judge McAvee hasn't been on the bench that long, so we don't have a long track record with him. But but what we have seen suggests he's somebody who's keenly aware and takes very seriously transparency with the public and trying to demystify the legal process a little bit. One of the first things he did was set a standing order for his courtroom, basically standing rules, the rules of the road, that live streamed on YouTube every one of his hearings, every mm -hmm. one of his trials. Um, he's also a younger judge, and you might imagine that He's a little more tech savvy, a little more willing to bring those cameras in. Georgia's a great state for that in general, but he's taken some proactive moves to emphasize that even more. And I, I think he understands that in a case like this in particular, making sure as best you can that every I is dotted, every T is crossed is, is crucial to faith in whatever outcome we ultimately arrive at. And as a young judge on the bench, he's dealing with the case that we've never seen before, mm -hmm. a president facing criminal charges, and this is not the only case that he's facing criminal charges. We have three other cases that, yeah. that the, the former president is facing. So he had to kind of handle the situation very delicately. Let me go one step even further. In Fulton County, a lot of people don't know this, in Fulton County, judges are assigned cases at random. Mm. That means Scott McAvee, with <laughs> only about a year of experience as a judge, he's in his early 30s. Yeah. A baby judge is what they call them in, in legal circles sometimes. They're brand new and you're learning a new thing. He gets assigned the biggest case of the year. Uh, the biggest case, I don't want to be hyperbolic here, but I think you'd have a hard time finding a bigger case to ever come through this city. It lands on his desk and he's sorted, he's tasked with sorting all of this out. I think that's a fair point to say it's the biggest because to your point, Ariana, of all the cases the former president is, is facing, this one is key because under Georgia law, if there were to be a conviction, he could not, in a sense, pardon himself. That's so correct. there is a lot weighing on Georgia's case more than any of the others. I want to bring up a point about how difficult it is to find someone willing to take this on. That wasn't the judge's choice. But in terms of having a prosecutor take this on, it was really interesting. We heard from former Governor mm -hmm. Roy Barnes, his testimony about DA Fonnie Willis approaching him saying, would you take on this case? Would you be part of this? And he gave a number of reasons why he wouldn't, which is then why she pursued Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade. Let's listen in to his response about why he would not take this case. It was sometime uh, in 2021, and uh, she asked me to come down, and uh, I met with her and Nathan Wade, and there were several other in the meeting. Uh, she asked me, uh, said they were beginning this investigation, and she asked me if I'd be interested in being special prosecutor, to which I replied that I had mouths to feed at a law office and uh, that I could not, I would not do that. So that's former Governor Roy Barnes talking about why he would not take on this case. Because of the extraordinary amount of work, the pressure mm -hmm. being under the microscope, not to mention we have reported extensively on death threats right. made exactly. to people within the DA's office. So there are a lot of layers to this case. Nothing about it is simple or easy. And he spoke to that. He said, I didn't want to take on this case because I live my life with bodyguards. And mm -hmm. that's not something I'm not trying to do anymore. He's, he, and uh, in, in really in a series of two days of hearings that were full of surprises, Roy Barnes was not on, I think, anybody's uh, I, thought of list yeah. of who's going to appear. And it just shows the scope of this case, how many mm -hmm. folks in public life in Georgia it's touched. And I think it's a good, a good indication, too. Obviously, Roy Barnes was approached to be the special prosecutor to, to fill the role that ultimately went to Nathan Wade, right? But he might be a good litmus test to hmm. what the Prosecuting Attorney's Council of Georgia may face if it gets to a point where the DA decides that Nathan Wade's going to stay, meaning her whole office is disqualified, and the PAC 
The prosecuting attorney's counsel of Georgia then has to find a new home for this case. You saw Roy Barnes didn't want to take it on as a special prosecutor. The PAC may well find that many elected district attorneys share at least some of those sentiments and are not eager to take on this case for a host of reasons, many of which may be the resources and the time required to pursue it effectively. You know, to that point, if they can find someone else willing to do this, saying, I'll take on this case, I'll be the special prosecutor, we're talking about thousands of hours of work, research, investigation, knowledge of the intricacies of this case, how all the players connect, even for this RICO charge of racketeering and working together towards a, a criminal enterprise, so to speak. If that even were to happen, could we even fathom how far back that would set this timeline? Again, for a lot of reasons, taxpayer money being one of them, but also we are approaching an election and one of the defendants is the GOP candidate mm -hmm. for president. It's going to take time. It's going to take a lot of time. Uh, it, we've already seen this case get delayed. Uh, this has been, a, a, like I said, two months. It's been almost 10 weeks now mm -hmm. just spent just spent on the issue of potential disqualification of the district attorney, Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade, in her office. That's 10 weeks where I think, I mean, I've seen maybe one ruling, one order on issues actually related to the charges mm. or to the evidence in this case. That's 10 weeks that are gone that have not been spent, at least as far as we can see, at least kind of in the, the, the front yeah. burner, so to speak, spent on moving this case towards a trial. Mm -hmm. That time is gone. Mm -hmm. So at the very least, the idea of getting to trial, even if it stays in Fulton County, getting to trial before the election date will be a challenge. It's not impossible. Mm -hmm. Legal experts say it can be done, but it'll be tough. If it goes to a different district attorney's office, I'm not in a position to, to make a statement definitively one way or another, but I know that every legal expert that we've spoken with has said, if it goes to a different DA's office, that is gonna be almost impossible to have a final resolution, a, a, a verdict, a trial verdict before the election. It's not like cramming for a test. Uh, you, know, no. you can't just cram for a test, right? If you're just joining us, I'd like to take a moment to, to reset that uh, this morning a decision came down from Judge McAfee in the case to try to disqualify DA Fonnie Willis and Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade. And in what we have essentially is a split decision, the judge ruling that DA Willis must either step aside with all of her, with everyone in the DA's office, or cut ties with Special Prosecutor uh, Nathan Wade before the election interference case against Mr. Trump and all the defendants moves forward. So really a, a split decision here, either DA Fonnie Willis and her office stays or Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade stayed because the judge basically ruling that Conflict was not proven, but there certainly was an appearance of conflict. And he seems to, to be giving a lot of weight, and I want to couch this with saying we're all reading this together. You talk about you, you can't cram for a test. You can't, but we are <laughs> trying to uh, do our homework in public. At least I am. I'm working through this 23-page this order in real time. But it seems like Judge McAfee gave particular weight to the testimony he heard at those mm -hmm. two days, that explosive hearing, oh, yeah. two days of evidentiary uh, hearings where we heard from the district attorney herself. We heard from Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade, and we heard from others as well. It seems like he's, he's putting a pretty good deal of stock in what he heard there. Many legal experts we talked to said that Nathan Wade's testimony at times from the stand seemed to be less credible, perhaps, mm -hmm. than, than, than it could have been, particularly in regards to questions about uh, his divorce proceedings, mm -hmm. some answers to some legal documents in that case. And uh, when he was questioned by the defense team, he, he gave some answers that legal observers said, you know, their ears perked up when they heard it. It seems like Scott McAfee, Judge Scott McAfee, his ears may also have perked up mm -hmm. because this, this ruling really sort of singles out Nathan Wade as in the, the, the fountainhead of the, the problem here, if there is one. Yeah, and I do want to bring to, uh, to your attention a, a 
point in the testimony that got a lot of attention on social media when they spoke about the trips that they went on, mm -hmm. money changing hands. And in his ruling, he says um, the district attorney's testimony that the evidence demonstrated that the financial gain flowing from a relationship with Wade was not a motivating factor. And that was something defense attorneys, they really honed on saying that she yeah. really just hired him because she financially benefited from the relationship from him taking on this job and he says based on that evidence I don't think that's the case. How many times did, did you hear us say the phrase uh, financially benefit, mm -hmm. uh, improperly financially benefit from this desk and elsewhere? It was a key issue in all of the arguments before the judge. There's not a ton of case law on this especially with facts like this that we've seen here. It's There's some on disqualification issues but this is a bit of a unique situation. The few really on point cases, the precedent that, that is out there, that's why we heard so much about the conflict and about the financial questions. The defense team was trying to argue effectively that there was a sort of circular pattern of impropriety, as they put it, that uh, they were dating, mm -hmm. that Fonnie Willis, District Attorney Fonnie Willis, awarded this contract that you know, ultimately helped mm -hmm. Nathan Wade earn hundreds of thousands of dollars, him and his firm, and that then Nathan Wade spent some of that money on vacations mm -hmm. for the two of them as a couple, and that that circular pattern was somehow deliberate and was somehow, and this is the important part, incentivizing the prosecutors mm -hmm. to continue their case, basically removing their ability to impartially decide mm. what might happen. Sure. And, and you know, what, maybe they see some evidence and they say, you know what, we actually need to remove a defendant or drop a charge. The argument was that they had this personal interest that mm -hmm. would prevent them from making that decision. But Judge Scott McAfee says, I'm not buying it. Yeah, he says, that did not happen. To read from, from it, uh, quote, he says the judge found there was, quote, no actual conflict brought about by the relationship, quote, without sufficient evidence that the DA acquired a personal stake in the prosecution or that her financial arrangements had any impact on the case. The defendant's claim of an actual conflict must be denied, but this split decision really points to maybe the appearance of conflict. But as you're talking about this point, I remember that famous quote that D.A. Willis said that the only man to foot her bills is her daddy. daddy. Exactly. And we saw her father come on to the stand and mm -hmm. testify, mm -hmm. you know, some of the practices that she testified to, saying that she kept cash on hand. It was something that her father taught her. And he came on stand to speak to that, saying that, mm -hmm. you know, in the black community, they don't trust the bank. And that's a practice that he passed on to her to really kind of make the case as to why she always had cash on hand and never really used her credit card. There was no financial records tied to the money exchanging mm -hmm. hands. And that was corroborated by a business owner in California, mm -hmm. one of the trips that she took. Yeah, and we do have um, a, a soundbite from part of her testimony on that part. Absolutely nothing to do with this. It's interesting that we're here about this money. Mr. Wade is used to women that, uh, as he told me one time, the only thing a woman can do for him is make him a sandwich. We would have brutal arguments about the fact that I am your equal. I don't need anything from a man. A man is not a plan. A man is a companion. And so there was tension always in our relationship, which is why I would give him his money back. I don't need anybody to foot my bills. The only man who's ever foot my bills completely is my daddy. That underscores what we're talking about mm -hmm. here. And it seems like from Judge Scott McAfee's order, he put a lot of credence in that. Yes. Um, and here's a line. We're talking about the delay, the argument that uh, there is a personal interest here and that the district attorney and special prosecutor Nathan Wade were somehow incentivized to drag this thing out. So Scott McAfee right here says he's not buying that at all. He says, and I'm quoting here, the defendants argue that the financial arrangement created an incentive to prolong the case, but in fact there is no indication that the district attorney is interested in delaying anything. Interesting. He's saying the DA's office wants to get this thing to trial. The idea that yeah. uh, they're trying to drag this thing out in Judge McAfee's view that doesn't carry water. They've had their head down working on this for a very long time. In fact, really from day one of her taking office, it was really on her plate and it's been full steam ahead ever since. 
You know, from an outside perspective, I appreciate your insight both as a journalist and someone with a law degree, so happy to have yes. you here. Because from an outsider looking in, it feels like a very easy decision. The judge says either D.A. Willis and her office stays or prosecutor Nathan Wade stays. To the outsider, that seems kind of like a no-brainer because if she stays, it stays in Fulton County. Is that accurate to really think that that would be pretty clear-cut? I don't think anything in this case has been particularly yeah. clear-cut here. This has been, in, in some ways, a, a communal mini-class in the law that we've all been engaged in as we sort of watch and try to make sense of these orders and these arguments and the testimony in this case that has legal experts, seasoned lawyers, saying, whoa, I've never seen anything like this. Mm -hmm. Nothing about this decision, I am sure, for Judge Scott McAfee was easy to get to. There was a reason it took nine, ten weeks to get there. Uh, a lot of legal experts we've spoken with, and I'm getting some texts, and if you see my, me look at my phone, <laughs> forgive me, I'm not being rude, but we're getting a lot of messages in <laughs> yeah. from folks we want to hear from. Uh -huh. Many of them have different takes on this ruling. The one thing I'm hearing consistently from everybody is them commending sort of the measured approach that Judge Scott McAfee mm -hmm. took here, acknowledging what they see as an effort to take the time necessary, make sure that all the necessary facts, all the relevant facts are kind of in the record, and then make one decision that solves the problem mm -hmm. as justly and as, as best as the judge can manage. And they, they read this ruling and they think that he's, he's done a fairly adequate job of navigating that. One text in particular noted, and they said, <clears throat> excuse me, they said, wow, I think this ruling might take some of the temperature down. Mm -hmm. Which is a monumental feat in a case that is as emotionally charged as this because both sides claim political motivation, right? You have one side, you know, saying that it's a desperate attempt to discredit a lawyer. Uh, mm -hmm. It's politically motivated uh, because former President Trump is involved. The other side saying there's a political motivation to pursue the case in such a, a assertive manner. So to, to talk about a temperature coming down is, is very significant yeah. and important because uh, one more note, I, I'm just reading here along with you all, uh, the judge says, quote, the prosecution is encumbered by an appearance of impropriety as the case moves forward. It's reasonable that members of the public are still left to wonder. And in a case with this much charge around Attention. it, that, yeah. that is a key. It is. And there's a reason we spent so much time hearing about this legal battle over standards, over legal standards. It, it's it's pretty deep in the legal tall grass. It's mm -hmm. not something necessarily everybody hears about every day, but the question was so important. Does the judge apply the more narrow actual conflict standard, meaning only the showing of an actual conflict is enough to disqualify? Or does he adopt a more broad standard that says an actual conflict or the appearance of a conflict is enough to disqualify? And there were cases that pointed in both ways. You saw both the defense team and the prosecutors arguing vigorously over that matter. That was the key issue at oral arguments in the final chance they had to make their cases before the judge. And it seems like Judge McAfee is putting some credence into the idea of the appearance, particularly in this case, mm -hmm. being an essential ingredient. Yeah, he actually says that was a bad choice on both parts, for mm -hmm. DA Fonnie Willis and Special Pro Prosecutor Nathan Wade. He says it in the ruling, bad choices. Georgia law does not prohibit the finding of an actual conflict for simply making bad choices even repeatedly. Mm. Yeah. There was, it, it reminds a little bit of another big ruling in this case. Cheryl, you pointed out this has been a, a prosecution many years in the making now. Uh, the special purpose grand jury, rewind several years, sure. was spun up to begin the investigative process that ultimately landed on this indictment that we see the, the 19 named defendants that were indicted over the summer. During the special purpose grand jury process, there was one person who was being investigated. Uh, that was now Lieutenant Governor Burt Jones. And the district attorney attended a fundraiser for his then political opponent. And the, Lieutenant Governor Burt Jones' team said, whoa, wait a second, that's, that's a conflict of interest. You're attending a political fundraiser for my opponent while I'm running for office. Mm -hmm. what, what's, that, that can't be. And the judge at the time, Robert McBurney, in a somewhat similar ruling, he said, look, many times it's the actual conflict standard, but in a case like this that's so unusual and so high profile, mm -hmm. even the appearance is enough. 
And he said the district attorney's office could not pursue Burt Jones in that case. Mm. I want to end with one line from the ruling. Quote, as long as Wade remains on this case, unnecessary perception of a conflict will persist. End quote. That's from the ruling from Judge McAfee. You wonder if that is maybe leaning towards one of the two options, one option being DA Fonnie Willis stays on this case with her team or special prosecutor Nathan Wade stays on this team. A split decision coming down, breaking news this morning. We will follow much more on 11 Lives News app and update you on 11 Live News at noon.